there, it's Olivia Savannah here from Olivia's Catastrophe and today I'm here to give you my February wrap up. In the month of February I read 24 books which required a lot and I'm here to tell you my thoughts and feelings on all of them. I'll have content warnings in the description box down below but without further ado let's get right down to the books because we've got quite a few to go through here. I finally did it, I finally read Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid, just like everybody recommended in time for the TV series and I wasn't stubborn and went for the audiobook just like everyone recommends and I had a really really good time with it. So Daisy Jones and the Six, as you probably all already know because I'm the last and behind on the hype, is about a band. This band are the Six and they're doing quite well and they kind of join up with Daisy Jones who is a brilliant singer as they make an album together. However, there is quite a lot of the like drug and drinking culture going on and it's about whether the band can survive making this album together or not, more or less. And yeah, it was just really, really good. Taylor Jenkins Reid has this uncanny way of being able to write celebrity characters in a way that makes them approachable and down to earth, but in a way that is also incredibly realistic. So much so that you could think this was a real interview documentary style type of thing for people who really exist. I was so impressed with the way that she manages to make every single character, because there's quite a lot of them, Daisy Jones and the Six, that's seven, main characters, all of these characters come to life, all of them feel realistic, all of them feel individual and at no point did I get confused with who was who, at no point did I question why characters were doing things, the character craftsmanship in this book is absolutely unbelievable. That said, there were characters that I was drawn to more than others. My favourite character is actually a secondary character, Camilla, but the fact that my favourite character is a secondary character is revolutionary because there were so many characters. So I'm just amazed by how well she managed to make each of these characters. There are two that get a lot more time, Daisy Jones, who's kind of painted as this girl who comes out of nowhere with this amazing talent and kind of gets caught up into the lifestyle very quickly and also Billy who gets caught up into the lifestyle for different reasons and is trying to back his way out of it and to stick to being the family guy while also being a rock band singer and I just think it was a magnificent journey with these characters and their development or lack of development in some ways because we see two characters who are so similar in so many ways and struggling with so many of the same things but who could not be more distinct and different from each other and it was amazing to see the ways in which Daisy reflects Billy and Billy reflects Daisy. I thought that was all very fascinating and really well portrayed and done but at the same time it wasn't all about them, it wasn't just about what's going on in their lives. I loved all of the music moments, seeing them talk about producing music, the singing, the songwriting, the actual nitty gritty of being a band and getting the album done and the cooperation and working together that needs to be done fascinated me. I am someone who loves music, I love all of the like behind the scenes information about producing and photo shoots and all of the creative industry process to it too. I love all of that so seeing it written into this story in such detail was really enjoyable for me, such a pleasant thing to experience and I just think this book did an amazing job of showing how you really can misunderstand or easily misunderstand someone if you don't know enough about them and the ways that communication can be complicated and I'm not saying this book is full of miscommunication trope but you understand the character's actions, you can understand where they don't understand each other and you can understand how that can be frustrating before they get to know someone better and I just thought it was really really good. In some ways this is a simple story, in some ways it's a love triangle, in some ways it's about a band getting together who might not be able to stay together, it's about the rock and roll lifestyle and the pros and the cons of that, in some ways it's a simple straightforward story but in some ways it's also way beyond that and way more than that and I really appreciated it. I do think the ending could have been more explosive. The way it was lining up and gearing things up I was like this is gonna explode, it's gonna be massive, I can't wait. And then it was actually much more of a quieter ending than I expected but it also made sense for the characters so I can't begrudge the book that much for doing that. I also read You Made a Fool of Death with Your Beauty by Akweki Amezi, which I'd been really looking forward to, and this one was divine. It was just absolutely divine. So in this one we're following Faye, she is a black 
woman who's an artist, she's a widow, so she's kind of been continuously grieving her past husband, and she is quite young still. They were high school sweethearts, as you would say, in the US, and so she wants to kind of open herself up to love again. And man, this book is messy. It's messy with a capital M E S S Y. Messy. The romantic entanglements in this are beyond me. I was just like how can you how can you be this way how can you be this messy and yet i was reading it and i was i was here for it i wanted to know more this is what i would call revolutionizing the romance genre because there is no third act breakup in the way that you would expect there is no miscommunication this characters these characters they're always clear about where they are in the relationship what they're doing everybody's on the same page and yet there's still drama there's still complications and where that drama falls I've never seen it fall in those places in romance books before so this felt very revolutionary it gave me a new idea of a new understanding of what the romance genre can really be in terms of representation fantastic we see this black woman who is coming to terms with herself emotionally and is like learning about herself and what she wants in life. I appreciated the fact that we get to see a black creative. I appreciated how racism is not an issue in this book at all. It doesn't come up. I appreciated the fact that you get to see this black woman preparing to go on holiday. And she's choosing what colour her hair should be and what outfit she should wear. And I don't think I've seen characters that so accurately represent what it's like to travel as a black person and all that preparation that goes into it. I appreciated that. We've got queer characters, we've got bisexual main characters, we've got lesbian best friends and I think I can't speak on that representation but it was just nice to see that queerness on the page and to read it I thought it was done well. Quakey and Mezzi's writing is magical, mystical and perfection. A Quakey can write in any genre they want to and they do it marvellously and sometimes as a writer it can be even frustrating to see because they took the romance genre and they wrote beautiful things and I wanted to drink in these words and soak in them and lavish in them because that is how lyrical, poetic and beautiful it was but it was also the romance genre that's my favorite kind of writing style for romance and they mastered it <sighs> and also in terms of good quality writing it can only be masterful writing if i can disagree single-handedly with every single decision these characters made i disagreed i disagreed with my whole chest and yet I still really enjoyed this book and yet I could understand why the characters were doing the things they were doing and yet I couldn't blame them for any of their choices even though I didn't always like the ways in which they went about them and I think you just have to be a masterful writer to be able to do that to have characters that really infuriate and enrage you and then sometimes likeable and then sometimes not likeable and they're never entirely likeable or unlikable they're that grey area in the middle Mm, so perfect to be able to write that in a way that feels effective and brilliant. I don't know what more I can say about this book other than it was also beautiful. There's a grief storyline in this as I've mentioned. She is a widow and she needs to move past that grief while acknowledging that she will never be able to move past that grief. And the way that storyline, that emotional storyline, amongst all the romantic drama, unfolds and happens is kind of amazing and beautiful and heartbreaking all at the same time. The book ended in the perfect place for the book to end. A quakey mezzi, you've done it again. I read The Mysteries of Thorn Manor by Margaret Rogerson. I mentioned here on this channel before, I'm a big fan of Margaret Rogerson. I think she's writing some of the most fun fantasy books out there right now, and this novella is no different. It's a like sequel to Sorcery of Thorns in some ways, so it's set after those events have happened. And again, this is one that just kind of blew my mind because I love a good sentient house and I often love sentient houses in gothic fiction. So it didn't occur to me that I could have a magical sentient house in a fantasy book. And this gave that to me and I was having so much fun and having such a good time at seeing this moody, sentient, magical house and the mysteries of it being unlocked by our two main characters. In some ways this furthers a romance that kind of buds in the first book and it was nice to see these couples kind of, and I feel like they know each other by this point but grow even deeper within each other and really get to know each other on an entirely different level. I thought that was so sweet to see. In terms of the romance, again, this kind of revolutionised things to me because I did think I understood and appreciated in the first book how perfect Elizabeth is as a female lead. In terms of the romance, she is taller than her male love interest. I don't think I've read a book 
that I can remember or that had a bit of impact on me where the female lead was taller than the male one, where the female lead was stronger and like bigger and had a more voracious diet than the male main lead. He's there like with his magical powers and whatever and she's there with the sword doing the defending, the one who loves armour, the one who is that kind of role but in no way at any point does it feel like not like other girls trope, it doesn't delve into that at all and I just loved how it was handled even though I loved Elizabeth in the first book I loved her even more in this one, I loved the house even more than this one and one of the big sellers for me for Sorcery of Thorns, one of the reasons why I adored it so much was because of the demon who often turns into a cat who is really, really powerful and really scary, but also human in more ways than you would think. And there are so many scenes of this with that demon and deeper conversations about what happens at the end of the first book that have to do with the demon. And I loved it. I loved getting to see the banter between all of the characters. I loved getting to see the jokes. I love the house. I love the romance. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I do think the ending was a bit quick and abrupt, but it's a novella, you know? You can't have it all in under 200 pages. It was just really, really good. And again, so much fun. I will never stop screaming from the rooftops about how much fun Margaret Rogerson puts into her fantasy books, and this is no different. I also read All Boys Aren't Blue by George M. Johnson. I've mentioned this in my books by black authors that I recommend video because it was just really, really good. I gave it five stars and it was a brand new favorite for me. I loved it. I loved it, I loved it, I loved it. This is a young adult memoir where George talks about what it's like for them growing up black, growing up queer, and growing up in the US. I think this one was so approachable because it is a young adult memoir, so it talks about racism, it talks about homophobia they faced, it talks about finding your identity, finding out who you are, and the ways in which the people around you let you do that or can also hold you back from that, but also the ways in which you yourself can hold you back from that and also let yourself do it at certain points. I think it was really good because it talks about school, which is something that I think a lot of young adults can relate to, but also it was just so emotionally touching and deep because it felt so personal. And I guess when you're reading a memoir, you are looking for that personal touch and George M. Johnson really gives that to you. They write letters where they talk to, where they address certain people in their lives who've been significant in their journey of growth, whether that's a mother, an elderly parent, such as like a grandmother, a nana, or even like a cousin and such. And those letters and how they talked about their experience with that person, but then how their experience with that person reflected on how they viewed themselves and their identity, whether that's for the positive or whether that's for the negative, it was just so personal and so emotionally deep. It was reflective at times, and I think having that hindsight and reflection and wisdom in those letters is gonna really help young adults, but it also really puts you into that moment in their life in a way where I think young adults reading it can relate to it and feel like, oh, this is how I'm feeling now in certain ways. I just think those letters were a really good touch and such a great way to really add to the story, but also there are those prose chapters. There are moments where they call things out and say, this is what happened to me, but now I know this X, Y, and Z, and now I can recommend this instead. And in no ways is it a self help kind of book, but it feels like one that is going to help people. It's so good to have that representation out there. It's written really well. And it was just something that I learned from. I'm an adult reading this young adult memoir, but I'm also someone who does not have those exact same experiences. And I could learn from this and I could take from this in a very clear and easy to understand way. And in some ways, George M. Johnson's identity journey has expanded beyond this book because now, of course, they are non-binary and it shows the ways in which they set themselves up to have that freedom to express and explore gender, express and explore sexuality as they're growing up. And I think that freedom to explore is something that teenagers deserve and should be given. And this is a book that will help them along that journey. I have gone hard and fast at trying to read some of the oldest books in my TBR. So I read The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo by Stieg Larsson, which I've been meaning to read for a very long time. This is a translated kind of mystery thriller book. It's a big chunky book, didn't need to be that big and chunky, but it was also really, really interesting. I'm glad that I read it, but it's by no means one that I feel very 
much like it was as worth the hype as the hype gives it. So in this one we're following a journalist and after some drama about things that are true and not true kind of tainting his reputation, he gets tasked with discovering where a missing woman has got to for this very prestigious, very rich family. So he's trying to solve that mystery. There's also this girl who's really good at being a private detective in some ways and discovering and digging up information on people and maybe they end up working together and then there's also this whole big thing going on about the corporate or company and the person behind that business that the journalist was investigating and where his reputation was tarnished by in that investigating process. So there's quite a few threads to this story and I have to admit all of the stuff about the journalism and the investigating into this businessman who seems quite corrupt but they're not sure they can prove it. All of that I didn't care about in the slightest. I felt like it gave me trust by Hernan Diaz vibes where everybody's investigating and looking into it but I don't actually care. You marketed me a thriller mystery book and I'm here for the thriller mystery element and that's it. Maybe things will tie together eventually but that's not where my priority is. So all of the pages about that kind of felt very long, felt very dry and I just wanted to get through them. In terms of the mystery element, the mystery itself was actually quite solid, was quite good and the solving of it was interesting to see but it went on for too long. You could have chopped down those pages and given me that mystery in about 200 pages to 300 and I would have been much happier but the mystery itself and the contents of it was interesting. I liked seeing that unfold. I really liked the characters, I liked seeing them having to work together and the ways in which they completed each other but also very much differ from each other and use different kind of avenues to get where they needed to be. It's kind of nice to have two people working on a case and not just one detective with a sidekick but more so they're both bringing different elements to detecting and solving the mystery to the table and when they work together both on an equal par and level of with each other it kind of bring something new to the table. It felt very like an equal co-working balance and that's kind of nice to see in a mystery thriller. I often see the detective and the sidekick but this was a new dynamic for me. I do think sometimes the writing of this got a bit stale so when you read a cold case you often have like this person did this at this time and sometimes when it was just writing about the characters doing the investigating it would slip into that language which made it all feel a bit dry, made it all feel a bit like I was reading a cold case document and that I can understand and stylistically choosing to do that to bring about the mystery atmosphere a bit more to the forefront of the book but it did mean it just felt a bit dry and boring at times so it was good but it wasn't the best and I won't be continuing the series. Then I read The Killing Joke by Alan Moore and illustrated and coloured by Brian Bolland. This is a graphic novel I guess or you can call it a comic which has to do with the Joker and Batman. I loved it. I gave this five stars. It's a new favourite. I've been meaning to read this forever and yes, I adored it. I adored it. Batman, so what some of you might not know is that I do read comics sometimes and I don't include them in wrap ups, but Batman is my favourite superhero. So I was already biased. And while Joker is not my favourite villain, I think he's a really interesting villain and a really, really good one. And this was just the perfect graphic novel to me. I'm realising while filming my wrap ups today I really do like an open ending and this has a very interesting open ending that leaves you thinking, leaves you guessing at what happens next and it leaves you guessing what happens next in a way where you can have endless debates about it in the fandom which is always fun. I really 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 love the artwork in this. I think the storyline is amazing, it's so good but the artwork is just on level with the storyline and that just added to it all the more. So the artwork in this, the way that the shadows are used, the way that the colouring is used, sometimes everything's bleached in flashbacks but there'll be one prevalent colour throughout the, the panels. I think that was very cleverly done and effectively done. There's a lot of focus on like hands and perspective in the artwork which again it shifts your focus to thinking and looking at different things and that again added to the storyline it's just like in a graphic novel where you get the artwork and the story feeding into each other so well the writer and the artist really on the same page in some ways it just adds to the book so much more especially when it's not just one person doing both the artwork and the storyline so the way that this 
illustrations worked in tandem with the storyline really made this what it was for me. As for the story, I feel like the Batman was in character, the Joker was in character. I loved the Joker in this. I actually found his jokes to be quite entertaining and funny and I loved his sarcasm and wit and kind of twist on words. But I also liked how even though Batman and Joker were often saying very different things and doing very different things, you could not help but see the similarities between both their characters, their actions and their mindsets, which again just contributes to the ending but the way in which you can compare and contrast, I sound like an IB essay, but the ways in which you can compare and contrast the Joker and Batman in this graphic novel is just so very interesting and I could write a whole essay on it, especially studying the panels to kind of further describe that. It does some daring things, it gives the Joker an origin story, I think it worked, I think it such a good job of humanizing the Joker that we get to know in this one. It also doesn't give Batman any backstory and I think that's a very interesting choice to see Batman within the knowledge of how we know him overall. It kind of makes Batman a secondary character in this story because we learn so much about Joker and we just see Batman in the parallels of how we know him and we can lean on prior knowledge of what he's like but it also makes him a bit more of a wild card in this one which is fascinating because the Joker is often seen as a wild card whereas in this I felt like I could easily predict what the Joker would do because of the fact that we learn so much about where he starts from but we don't learn any of that about Batman. Anyway, that's me just getting into deeper analysis. I thought this was fantastic, and if you like Batman and you like Joker, you've probably already read this, but if you haven't, please do. I had a period where I was really into middle grade fantasy, so I read a lot of them, and there'll be more of them in part two, but one of the ones that I read was Pages and Co, the first book in the series, which is called Tilly and the Book Wanderers by Anna James, and this is a middle grade series where book wandering exists where you can read characters out of stories and jump into them if you have that ability and we're following a young girl whose mother has been missing for a very long time and she discovers that she has the book wandering ability with one of her friends and so this one really largely focuses on fictional stories such as Anne of Green Gables, Alice in Wonderland and it's worth noting if you haven't read those two stories you might want to do so before this not only so that you kind of understand and appreciate some of the references but I do think it kind of spoils the ending of those books so you might want to read them before reading this one but this was really lovely it was a lot of fun but I don't think I'm going to be continuing the series I don't think I loved it as much as other people tend to I think oh and it also talks a lot about A Little Princess so that's another one where I think you should read it before you get to this one I think my problem with this is I fell more in love with the classics that I already read than with this particular story. Seeing Anne made me want to reread Anne of Green Gables. Seeing Sarah made me want to reread A Little Princess. And so my interest in the book itself was not as high as it was for the stories that it was reminiscing and drawing from. I liked that we got to see such an inquisitive young girl who was kind of exploring into books and loved reading. I loved the bookshop. It was really nice to see her develop a friendship with Oscar, who is the other secondary character in this one. All of that was really nice and I do think this book has a bit of, it's the first book in a series, they need to set up the dimensions of book wandering and what it means and how you can do that. It sets all of that up quite well but it does mean that the storyline in this just happened a bit quickly and it was quite a big storyline, there was quite a lot happening to it and so the fact that that happens largely in the last third of the book was nice, it was good, I think children will like it but me as an adult reader I was like, ah. It's the first book in a series. I could see that, I could understand that, but quite a lot happened in this storyline and I would have wanted elements of the end to be woven through the middle and beginning more clearly. So everything goes a little bit slower and steadier and reaches that climax in a place where I feel like I would appreciate the climax a lot more, if that makes sense. So overall, this was a nice story. It had nostalgic elements to it. It had that bookshoppy, book wormy feeling, which I think readers will be able to like if your child is a reader. But for me, the magic didn't quite capture me as much as I wanted it to. More surprisingly, I was actually very captured by A Pinch of Magic by Michelle Harrison. And this one is a bit of a witchy, magical, middle grade book. So in this one, we follow the Widdishins. They are three sisters and they discover that they are entitled to magical items which have been passed down in their family. And our main character, Betty, she just wants to go off of this island but she's never been allowed to leave the island and she doesn't know why until her grandma says that her family are cursed and if they leave the island they will die. 
and so she wants to find out about this curse, she wants to find out the ways in which she can break this curse and just maybe in doing so she might impact all of her sister's lives and maybe a whole magical adventure is going to ensue with those magical items because of wanting to break this curse. This one I just thought was a lot of fun. I didn't expect to enjoy it as much. I've been a bit wary when it comes to witchy stories lately because they're not particularly my cup of tea but this one was a very positive surprise. I think it did a good job of showing the parameters of the magic very clearly so you quickly understand what they can and cannot do and you quickly understand the stakes and the stakes are sky high. They're so high in this book. I was impressed by how daring it was. It felt quite like a mature story in some ways because of the fact that the stakes were as high as they were but it was also delving into what happened in the past and what set up this curse but then also how they can break it and also the trouble that they get themselves into so there's a lot of different threads to this story but they all tied up very nicely and also quite unpredictably I'm an adult reading this book and I wouldn't have been able to predict the end from the halfway mark at all I didn't predict the end in the slightest and I liked the fact that it was so magical and I was just along for the adventure as well and in some ways it felt very realistic, it had some of the like silly middle grade jokes you would expect that really worked with our audience but it also had some really impactful moments about sisterhood and what it means to be a middle child sister, whether when you're the younger sister you might not get taken as seriously, when you're the older one you kind of grow out of certain things, it kind of deals with those roles in being a line of three sisters and I come from a line of four sisters so slightly different but I could definitely see how this book accurately portrayed some of the things that we went through as children and how those roles change your dynamics and things like that so it was nice to see that kind of represented in a book in a way that felt realistic. There's a lot in here which has to do with responsibility and revenge and anger and forgiveness and I think those themes were done in quite a complex manner but also handled really well and woven into the fact that this is a magical adventure story at its core and yet it can deal with and tackle these really difficult subjects really good time with it. I read British by Apua Hirsch and this is a non-fiction book about race, identity and belonging with a specific look at what it means to be black British. I've read a lot of anti-racism books and I think this is the one that I can safely say is the closest to my personal experience because not only am I black British but she also talks about what it's like to be middle class and so it was interesting to read that because she encounters other black people of course as you do if you're black and British in the UK and she talks about differences that she experiences in her experience of being black and British that maybe some of the lower class black British people don't experience or the upper class black British people don't experience and she kind of talks about being black and race but also a lot about class and I don't think I've seen too many delve into class in such an in-depth way as this one. And also it's just so refreshing to see such a British focused one. I know there's black and British which I still very much need to read but this is the only other one that I've seen with such a big British skew. It talks about people like Ignatius which you will never hear about in the American anti-racism books because it's less relevant. It talks about British slavery and the role of Britain within that which I think is something that often gets overlooked. It talks about police brutality but specifically from a British lens which although yes police brutality happens in America I think there's it's much quieter and less talked about the police brutality that happens in Britain so it was quite insightful to see that discussed as well and it was just seeing this in Britain's perspective with Britain's framing is so valuable and I hope that any British people that watch my channel who want to learn more about black British history and ways to be anti-racist as someone who lives in Britain this is definitely a book that I would recommend to you. She does go to her home country sometimes and she talks about what that experience is like as someone who is black British middle class going back to that country. She talks about how she develops her own identity so there's some personal stories about identity but she does look into other people's experiences too and she does frame it in context of history largely as well as looking at the present. I thought that was all really well done. You can tell she's done her research, you can tell she knows how to write clearly and eloquently. I do want to say that sometimes she makes some 
statements about identity where it's things that she doesn't understand so she kind of tosses them out and maybe that wasn't the best way to go like for example when she's talking about Isis and some of the discussions and controversies around that one of her statements that she makes is we need to evaluate why people feel a stronger identity to their religion than they feel to their race and to Britain, their nationality, which is interesting to me because she's clearly someone who doesn't have strong religious or faith practices, but yes, faith is someone's identity and can be someone's identity just as much, if not more than nationality. I'd rather, I personally consider my identity identity to be strongly, more strongly tied to my faith than to my nation and patriotism. And it didn't seem like she could comprehend that or bring that into the discussion. So of course, I feel like saying this book is only human, there are some things that it cannot cover, it cannot delve into, but there is so much here that it does cover, that it does delve into, that I haven't seen being done anywhere else. And that's where I think this book has places a lot of value on itself and I really recommend it. I read Embroideries by Marjane Satrapi. This is by the author who made Persepolis. It's a graphic novel. It's got a similar art style to Persepolis and it's also black and white. So if that's a reference that helps you, now you know. So this one is about a gathering of women and they just talk about their lives, their sex lives and their sex experiences. And it was nice, but also I don't think I'm gonna remember this in the long run. I think I read it in one and a half reading sprints because it is quite short and quick to read. I do find Margin Satrapi's art style quite simplistic. It's very bold, it's very black and white. And because of that, I think it worked really well in Persepolis where she's telling such a big topic and giving you so much information and also giving you a lot of emotional depth to it as well, where you need those simple and bold images so you don't get too lost in the images when you're really meant to be focusing on the story, on the information. But for this one where there's like no new information for me and it's more so focused on the stories, it would have been nicer if the artwork had a bit more weight to it and I don't think it necessarily did. And while it was nice to see kind of the differences in their sex experiences and their sex lives and to see on the page women just talking so candidly about all of these things and their experiences, it didn't really give me much more than that. Kind of like, these are some short stories about people's sex lives, that's it. There's no big moment at the end which ties everything together. There's no like consistency. I don't think I'm gonna take away a deeper meaning or message to this. It's just something that I read. And I feel like because women talking about their sex lives is still, in some ways, it's still revolutionary. Them talking about their pleasure, them talking about the ways in which they've found what they can enjoy when they've had so many pressures put upon them for marriage and for children and different things and surgeries and all of that. There's still so much that's revolutionary about this book and I guess the fact that it exists and that content is out there is revolutionary but I do also wish it could have done more within itself as a story to like emphasise those revolutionary elements to it. I read The Last Paper Crane by Kerry Drury and I gave this book five stars. It's a new favourite and it crushed my soul. It crushed my soul. So this book is about Hiroshima and the bombing of Hiroshima with nuclear bombs. It starts in verse. It starts as a grandfather talking to his granddaughter. And then it switches into flashing back to the day when the bombs are dropped, when the grandfather is a young boy. It switches into prose, there's illustrations, and it talks about the events of that day, what happened to him, and what happened to the people around him at the time and what he went through. It talks a little bit, it goes a little bit beyond that day and some of the aftermath and some of the recovery process. And then it goes back to the grandfather talking to the child and it goes back to being in verse. It goes back to being combined with haikus as well. And it summarizes the story and it finishes there. <laughs> and I just, I haven't felt so sad and so emotionally crushed by a story in a very long time. There's something about this book, and I believe it's written for young adults, and even though it's written for young adults, and even though in some ways it's not going as nitty and gritty into the gore and suffering and devastation, it goes into the gore and the suffering and devastation in a way where the language isn't too on the nose, but it's enough for the reader to kind of think about it and to understand how awful it was and to imagine and the words set up the framework for your emotions to do the rest. The illustrations, which are not 
gory or violent in any way, but in some ways emphasise the barrenness and the expanse of devastation and the shadows of what used to be in such a way that again, it's a framework for the emotion to do the rest. And so reading this book, I was, I, I'm not a crier, but I was internally crying the whole time I was reading that middle section because it's something that's really happened. It's something that people have really experienced. And you can't imagine, you can't imagine what it must have been like, and yet this book brings me as close to imagining as I possibly could of. I was reading this at the same time as I read a middle grade book which had to do with the threat of nuclear war, and I think it just... The two at the same time was a lot for me emotionally, and yet I couldn't stop reading. I was just so taken by this book. I was taken by the places that it took me. I think the novel in verse way that it wrote the book. Like the novel in verse writing was really effective. It was effective to kind of take us out of the story at the end and to take us out of that emotional place and put us in another one which felt a lot more hopeful. I appreciated that the author did that and didn't just crush us emotionally and leave us there. It kind of brought us back into the present day. We know the fact that the grandfather survives everything that happens in Hiroshima and it was one of the cases where often I think I've talked about how if you go back into flashbacks where you don't know where people survive it kind of gives you a spoiler. You know the character needs to survive for the things we've already read to have happened. But in this one I needed that tether, I was hanging on to that knowledge to kind of get me through the story. So as much as this was emotionally devastating, the author supplies you with the tools that you need in the writing to make it through this book and to not be as crushed as the author possibly could have done. It happens to be so sad and so emotional but powerful at the same time. I really like the fact that we have a Japanese illustrator for this and that it's got some of the traditional like paint swathes in this and the haiku format is included so it felt like culturally close to what it needed to be and spoke to those cultural elements. I'm not Japanese myself in any way or form so it'd be good to read own voices reviews of this but this was just a really crushing book and a really emotionally effective one and if you do want to kind of talk about nuclear war with your younger children or kind of talk about the events that happened. I think this could be a very good pointer discussion one and I do think it will also move adults similarly as well. Then I read Death by Shakespeare by Catherine Harkup. I'm a big fan of everything to do with death and grief. I'm also a big fan of everything to do with Shakespeare. So this book was perfect for me and this one goes over all of the deaths that happen in Shakespeare and whether those kind of deaths that are on the stage could have been actually done in this time if they're actually realistic or if Shakespeare was just making up ridiculous things to fill his plays and I like this one but I didn't love it as much as I thought I would given that it kind of embodies everything that I tend to like in books. My feelings with this one were that the author has done a lot of research and the author really knows her stuff and she's done everything that she could possibly do to make this book as detailed and as in-depth as possible, but there's only so much that Shakespeare gives her in the plays to work with. And so because of the fact that Shakespeare doesn't give much detail into the way characters die, a lot of this ends up being speculation of the ways in which these poisons, these stabbings, these things could have actually happened, but with no certainty that that's the way that Shakespeare meant them. She does a very good job of framing things in the historical period and framing things based on the medicinal and also the historical research that she's done. And she's like, this death could have been because of this, this and that. But personally, as a reader of Shakespeare, I'm less interested in speculation and I'm more interested in what we can really find out from the text. And because of the synopsis of this one, I thought there was enough there from the text for her to make those direct links concretely, but there isn't. And that's fine. And it's interesting to kind of read the speculations. And in some ways, this kind of feels more like a historical book about how death and grief worked in Shakespeare's time rather than a close analysis and study of his plays and the way the deaths happen in those plays. And I am, I know this as a personal reader, I'm more interested in the text on the page, I'm less interested in Shakespeare's life, I'm less interested in the author and the historical time period and I'm more interested in the plays. So entirely based on personal preference, this was just okay to me. And a lot of this is stuff that I knew. I did study Shakespeare for a whole year. I did read all of his works. There's a lot about Shakespeare that I already know. And so I didn't learn as many new things as I thought I would about Shakespeare or his plays from this book. But if you're newer to Shakespeare, if you haven't studied him for a whole year, 
then you're probably going to learn a lot of things about the bard which are interesting. What I did learn more about was death in historical England around Shakespeare's time period, so I can't say that I didn't learn anything new because I definitely did, but it wasn't exactly what I was searching for. In terms of disappointing reads, I read The Keeper by Tanneri Vadu and Stephen Barnes and it's illustrated by Marco Finnegan. This is a horror Afrofuturism graphic novel, but it felt more just like a slightly creepy graphic novel. It didn't feel very Afrofuturist at all. And yeah, I feel like the Afrofuturism elements comes from the fact that there's some familial history and heritage that's embedded into the horror. So I guess in some ways it is Afrofuturist, but it didn't give me enough. We're following this girl here on the cover whose parents die in a car crash and she's sent to live with her grandmother and it seems like there might be something that is looking after her it might be a keeper and maybe the keeper gets hungry sometimes so that's what's happening in this book and i do think the art style was a bit too simplistic for my liking i didn't love it as much as i thought i would and that's just on me you should always look through your graphic novels before you get them but i was just so keen to try something by this author and you know, afrofuturism horror all those buzzwords really got to me. So this artwork wasn't particularly my favorite, which I'm keen to overlook if the story is good, but I don't think this story was particularly creepy in the slightest for me. I wasn't scared at any moment. And it also felt quite simplistic and straightforward and very, very easily resolved. And those things made the story lack for me. Some jumps between pages in terms of time or in terms of scene that felt jolting. I didn't feel like there was enough lead up towards them or there was not enough of a distinctive change in colour palette to suggest that a jump had happened so it was always a bit jolting when it happened and I just don't feel like we got a good sense of the character even though we spend all of this time with this little girl I still wouldn't be able to tell you anything about her personality or why she chooses to do the things that she does and so lacking on character, lacking on plot, lacking on artwork means it's not a graphic novel for me. And then last but not least, I read Latvian Fairy Tales, which was a kind Christmas gift from Lena. So thank you, Lena. And this is a collection of Latvian fairy tales that I've translated. It's got illustrations to it, which were a nice addition to the reading process. And I just thought they were quite wild, but I think that about all fairy tales when you read them because you, you sometimes hear retellings of them and such and you think they're so distilled, but actually fairy tales are violent and fairy tales can be random sometimes. And so these were quite wild and they're very different from the fairy tales that I'm familiar with. So of course it was all like new to me. And I feel like if I learned more Latvian history, I would be able to appreciate these even more because I don't have the context that you might need to like really get everything and soak everything in about these fairy tales but it was still a good time. I think with these fairy tales I often struggled more so to see the morals in them and I feel like Brothers Grimm fairy tales for example or Hans Christian Andersen ones have more morals to them but reading the the commentary because there is some commentary in this and the introduction gave me a few more insights but I feel like it still didn't give me enough grounding. I liked the creativity of the fairy tales, I liked the translation, I feel like it was easy to read and I also liked comparing them to the fairy tales that I'm familiar with because sometimes I saw traces of Cinderella or I saw traces of Beauty and the Beast and I'm like so interesting to see how with a different culture the story just takes such a different turn and comes up as such a different outcome. And so I found that comparison quite interesting, but there were some stories where it was entirely different from what I'm familiar with. And it was just kind of nice. It was refreshing to see a different fairy tale than the one that I know, but I will admit that sometimes I felt like, what do I take away from this? And there wasn't too much that I personally could take away from it. But it was a good time. And there you have it. That's the first lot of the books that I read in February. I will have part two coming soon. Please let me know in the description box down below what is the last book that you read and what did you think of it. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Hit that subscribe button if you want to see more. And don't forget to hit that notification bell to be updated every time I have a new video. And you know what they say, onwards and upwards. Excelsior!